The Salesman Podcast, hosted by Will Barron, is brought to you by the HubSpot Podcast Network, the audio destination for business professionals. If you work in B2B sales or want to learn how to sell better, check out the Salesman Podcast. In fact, I shared Will's recent episode on 12 proven techniques you can start using today to improve your self-worth on the job. So do yourself and your sales team a favor and listen to The Salesman wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Augmenters. I'm Julie. And this is Jimmy. Hello. We are two business founders who started out as solopreneurs, yet found our greatest success when working with others. Mentoring is key to incredible relationships, and the Augmenters platform will help you get further faster because great relationships lead to better business and more fulfilling lives. You are here because you want to help others shine and see the light in themselves. We will support you in your mentoring journey with advice, tools, and stories that will augment your relationships to the next level. So strap on your ear pods, prepare to listen generously, and become an augmenter with us. Jimmy, I forgot my headphones again. No worries. Just turn up the volume into this next Augmenters episode. Hey, Jimmy. Morning. How are you doing? Great. It's a drizzly and beautiful autumn autumnal morning in Baltimore. It's a little broody. I feel like that's the right word for it. A little broody and a little coffee. I think the two go together. It feels broody with a seven-month-old in the house, for sure. <laughs> I am so excited about so many things. Can I tell you all the things I'm excited about? Julie, it's always nice when you're overly optimistic and try to say multiple things at once. But let's go with just two things this morning. What do you got? One, coffee, forever and always, making my own coffee, which is very strong. And two is this incredible interview and this incredible time we had with Jacqueline Baker, the author of The Unexpected Leader. I couldn't agree more. I think we all use the term, what a treat, for the recording we had with Jacqueline. I just had a blast. I was still humming for an hour or so afterwards. And she talked, one of the things that she talked about, which I thought about later, was this idea of, you know, her book is The Unexpected Leader. So it's very much about how to imagine yourself as a leader when maybe you've had things in your life that have led up to you not thinking of yourself as a leader. And after we did the recording, I went and had dinner with Lorna Davis. If you have not listened to her episode, it is phenomenal. I don't know what number it is off the top of my head. Episode you four. Know. Episode four, episode four. And I remembered that she had invited me to a leadership retreat. It was called Me to We to the World. And it was with her and fabulous woman named Gina Hayden. And one of the exercises was us walk of us sitting in a circle and getting up and standing in the middle of the room and saying, I am a leader, like having our kind of our own leadership manifesto, our leadership statement about ourselves. And it was the first time in my experience, it was about four or five years ago, maybe four years ago, that I had felt that I could step into a a leadership position and actually saying it out loud completely changed how I felt. So it was so fun to have the conversation with Jacqueline later to see Lorna and let her know how much that one exercise it really was pivotal. I feel like you do a lot of these different things. And then there are those things that really just stick with you. And since then I have felt way more confident. Of course, it's like an ongoing journey. I still have days where I have no clue what I'm doing or I feel like I have no clue what I'm doing, but that was a really big moment for me. So I wanted to tell you that story because I know you've heard a lot of my stories, but I don't think you've ever heard that one. I have not. And it's always funny to hear you say, oh, I'm just trying to figure it out. I'm not sure what I'm doing because that gives everybody else a lot of hope. I think we all have those moments where we're not totally sure what we're doing, but we just start. You just start, just like Jacqueline said. And I think your quote right there, Julie, just shows why you devoured Jacqueline's book, The Unexpected Leader, and how you and Jacqueline share quite a lot of the same traits we all do. And what I wrote down after our episode with Jacqueline was a way of trying to quickly synthesize whether it was unexpected leader or so many different pieces of Jacqueline's life. After our episode, I wrote down agency plus vulnerability, the etiquette of Jacqueline Baker. I thought she really brought together those two words in a way I had never thought of. And Jacqueline defined etiquette for me literally and figuratively in many ways during this upcoming episode. I don't have anything more to say. I think we should just dive right in. Let's roll. Off we go. 
I am so excited for this conversation. Jacqueline, thank you so much for joining us. So I was very excited to get your notes through a contact and say that you were just a phenomenal person to talk to about mentoring. I got your book, The Unexpected Leader. I loved it. Thank you. I flew through it. I made a million notes and we're so happy to have you on. Jacqueline, tell us a little bit about yourself. Thank you so much for having me. I am excited to be in spaces like this where platforms and committed people just like you and all across the globe are truly really committed to helping leaders become better leaders. I think that that's a huge part of the work that anyone does in the mentoring space, let alone the work that you're doing. My work always ladders up to one life thesis. And the reason why I have to like very succinctly go here is because I do lots of things and I've had lots of stops in my life, all of which I'm excited about. But truly how all the experiences that I have and all the things that I commit to doing, they ladder up to my overall life thesis and what I want my leadership legacy to be, which is at the end of the day, when I'm getting boxed up, ashes sprinkled around, people will say based on my actions that I help them start the things that they truly want to do and elevate to their next level of leadership. And so the two books that I've written, the podcast that I produce and release, I'm excited to be here for this conversation, but that's me in a nutshell. Can you give a shout out to your podcast? Where can we find you? Absolutely. Absolutely. We are actually coming up on our two year anniversary and our podcast is called Just Start From Ideas to Action, where people come with their ideas and we give them the tips, tools, resources, and storytellings to start the things that they want to do. It's on all the platforms forms that you can think of. And I'm just excited to be two years in and 120 episodes in as well. Hell yeah. I know. I know. Will you be our mentor? Oh, okay. I think it's awkward when people say, will you be my mentor? But maybe by the end of the conversation, we'll feel comfortable. Yeah. There's another way to ask that makes people like a lot more like maybe. Like I think mentor, the traditional word, as many of you, as you both probably know, people be like, well, what does that mean? Like, what does that entail? Like, am I your master? Like, what is this? Right. I think there's a way to ask that where people are like, oh yeah, I can get on board with without necessarily always using the mentor work, but happy to help you. I love when I heard that name of your podcast, yeah. Just Start. Start. Just Start. You have an idea, Just Start. Just Start. Literally. So how did you just start? Oh, I will go back to childhood in a way that probably people don't expect for me to navigate through. I was one of those people and still am one of those people who can't remember what I want it to be as a child. Like people say, what do you want to be when you grew up? I don't know. Like, I really don't know. I didn't live in a household where you were dreaming. And I think honestly, that set me up to be curious. I think that's one of the secret sauce things of my career is that I've remained curious. Several of the corporate jobs I've had have been created for me and they've been created because I haven't been someone that said, yep, my undergrad is in PR. My master's is in instructional technology. I have to go in those realms. It's more like, oh, sure, let's have a conversation and let me see if I'm interested in what you're talking about. But if I think about my my first start from an entrepreneurial standpoint, when I was in my early 20s, I'm originally from Detroit and I got my undergraduate degree and my master's degree from Wayne State University in Detroit. I remember I was working as an event management assistant at Wayne State at night and me and my good friend Zimmon, we were disgruntled about our jobs one day. I don't know why and what we were disgruntled about, but we were. And one day we were like, you know what, we can start our own event planning company. And we literally went down to the city county building shortly after that and started this business, this whole wedding business. We ran that business together for eight years, some of the best eight hustly, hard, figuring it out years of my life. But I never fell in love with weddings and event production. I love a good, a well-produced event, but I didn't fall in love with it. But I did fall in love with protocol and etiquette and order and understanding how etiquette can serve you. And so I launched 10 years ago, Scarlet. Scarlet is the leadership consultancy that I do work for now. And here is how Scarlet came to be a leadership consultancy. We actually started teaching etiquette to teen girls. That's how we started this work. And then six months into doing the work, the Detroit Lions called. And then Nike nice. called. I know. And the Department of Defense called asking for us to teach etiquette to their people. And I was like, wait, really? Like other people want this? Like other than teen girls? Like I never thought that we would do any work outside of teen girls because, you know, teen girls need etiquette, right? And, and so, so I realized- I have teenage daughters. So yes, I can totally- You know? That, yes. I, I have a seven month old, so I'll call you in like 10 years. <laughs> she, can, she can work on etiquette. <laughs> 
I don't, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. Seven months. Ooh. Okay. But I, I didn't, I just did not, I never fathomed. I never dreamed outside of where the, you know, kernel of the idea was, which was teaching etiquette to teen girls, which I still think is important and we still do, but I never thought we would do work for corporations. And what I've learned over time now is that companies weren't calling us necessarily to teach etiquette. They were calling us to help their leaders become better leaders, right? And etiquette is one of the ways that we do that. We do a number of different trainings that help leaders become better leaders, but they just didn't really know how to formulate that and to really say how they connected with the way we taught in a relevant, a real world and a modern way. And so that's truly how I got started going from etiquette to now the leadership consultancy. And of course, along the way, I've written two books. I produced a podcast, which we just talked about. I understand the importance of giving people the tools to help them start. So I've acquired two trademarks and, and several other things. But that truly is the humble, the honest, the wonderful beginning in ways that I never could have imagined growing up. Phenomenal. I want to get into the weeds just for a moment because you mentioned that etiquette wasn't the feature. It was, it was, it, the etiquette was the feature. The benefit was leadership. Yes. And that's a big idea in marketing, of course, features versus benefits. Mm -hmm. When did it dawn on you? Like, mm -hmm. What was the moment where you were like, oh, they don't want etiquette. This is it. Like, was there a certain piece, a moment that really struck you? Or did some leader come back or some like, person come back to you and be like, oh, Jacqueline, I thank you for everything because now I did, you know, leadership. Yeah. I can't say, because I'm not somebody who likes to dabble in lies. I can't say the exact moment when I realized that. But what I will say is time and time again, what was being communicated back to us after a session is I feel more confident. I feel more prepared. I feel ready. Because a lot of times people get etiquette mixed up. They think that etiquette is this thing that I turn on, that I use only when I'm around certain people, when I'm fancy, when I have money. The definition of etiquette is the accepted code of behavior for particular situations. That's all, right? It helps me to understand like, how do I navigate in and out of spaces? How do I know if a rule is a rule that I really want to stick to? If I feel like I need to break this rule because this rule isn't for me or this rule makes me feel like not inclusive, just all those things. So I can't think of the exact moment. You will have me thinking about that though over the next you know couple months, like when was that moment? But it was more people sharing with me and organizations sharing with me. My employees operate a little bit differently. My employees are showing up differently. They're stepping up. They're raising their hand. I start to realize like this is leadership. Like we have the opportunity to help leaders, number one, see themselves as leaders, give themselves permission to see themselves as leaders so that then they can lead others, lead communities, lead movements, maybe even change the world. That's incredible. That's incredible. I mean, this is such a big idea around etiquette. So curious as we're thinking about obviously mentoring being a big topic we're fascinated with. Are there ways that you were able to sort of connect beyond your work in etiquette? So Detroit Lines, I'm imagining like, you know, mentoring and then the next generation coming up. Were there ways that once you had kind of started this movement that your cohorts were maybe sharing ideas with each other? Yeah, absolutely. The one thing that is so amazing to me now, now that we've been in business for 10 years, is the people now that were kids when they were in our classes and are now adults and come and say, see, but even the simplest thing, like literally I was teaching in Atlanta Atlanta about three weeks ago for an organization. And this is an organization that caters to students that go to HBCUs, historically black colleges and universities. And one of the young men was in one of my classes a couple years ago and came to this conference. And he said, Ms. Jacqueline, he was like, I saw that you were on the agenda. They still call me Ms. Jacqueline, which I think is sort of funny, but I saw you were on the agenda and I heard that you were doing dining etiquette and leadership. He was like, and I instantly said, I know this stuff. He's like, and then I remember that I was in this interview about six months ago. He was like, and I could focus on the conversation. And that's the thing is I'm not saying that your spaghetti or your cheesecake is going to taste any different if you're going to use a dessert fork or a cocktail fork. Like it's going to be exactly the same. But the truth is- Are you sure? But like, what if I don't get enough of the actual food product on the fork? It's going to taste the same, Jimmy. Okay. Trust me. All right. <laughs> But you know what? If I know what the fork is, like I'm not focused on that, right? I'm not like, oh my gosh, like I'm sweating about should I use this soup spoon or this dessert spoon at the right time instead of focused on the conversation, right? And so that's the thing is know if I know like that's what this is for, this is what this is all about, I can actually focus on what's important. What I do experience is people that will come back to me saying this happened, right? That happened. Or an adult who may be in, in my class that says, I sent my kid through your class, right? Or, you know, you said something to my kid that wasn't really effective when I said it, which I think is like life-changing if I can say the same thing a parent is saying and the kid gets it, which I'm sure happens to you or will happen to you, Jimmy, when your seven month old becomes... I think it's already happened. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> she's brilliant. She's actually brilliant. 
it's confirmed. Yeah. yeah. So I do see the impact because students and adults will come back and say what they've learned and how it's impacted them, which is honestly one of the most heartwarming parts of the work that we do. My question about whether the client, which client was better being either the Detroit Lions or the federal government <laughs> uh, for another day, because I, I can't think either of those were a walk in the park. <laughs> Right. We've had some interesting, and I guess it depends on how you define easier, but we've had, our work has ran the gamut of so many industries, right? Like that, you know, some spaces are super conservative, which is interesting because how you get me today is how you get me every day. Like I don't instantly turn into like super astute Jack or like if I'm in front of the Department of Defense, like you're going to get me the same way. Why? Because your people are the same way. They may be acting like they're not this way, you know, in a forum setting, but they're this way and they're going to receive the information a little bit better if I'm more a little bit casual in nature. But no, Jimmy, you're not going to get me to say who was more difficult or who was easier. Okay. All right. Great. <laughs> Got it. I do that for drinks on the basketball court in Baltimore. That part. <laughs> okay. So I want to talk about leadership yeah. and I want to talk about your book. And I want to say that you really inspired me so much. I don't want to go on and on about my own leadership journey, but I am a leader of an organization and I have had a lot of fear about leading. I felt mm -hmm. very uncomfortable. I really related to a lot of your stories about your scholastic background. <laughs> I was, so asked leave, I was asked to leave my high school three times. I did really, really poorly in school. And I just thought of myself very much as unsmart. So I'm on page 31 here um, with lots of exclamation marks in the margins here because I really related to that. And so when it came time to actually run my own organization, I really, this whole you know concept of discovering the leader within you, I really related to. And I did find mentors along the way, people who reflected back to me like, I see you as a leader. You're acting like a leader. Like, how do you not see yourself as a leader? So I would love to hear like any advice that you have for folks kind of early on in this leadership journey, how they can either reflect back, how they can discover that leader within themselves and or how they can find somebody to help them. Oh, absolutely. I I'll say a couple things. First is thank you for your transparency on the educational scholarly path. And the reason why that was so important for me to share is number one, it was uncomfortable. And I find that a lot of times the uncomfortable things that I go through are the things that are the most powerful that I share with people. Like everything from, I share about anxiety, I share about self-doubt, I share about not feeling very smart. That's just important. Um, but I also think that academic abilities, especially earlier in our life, have such a bright spot and they often shape what you think about yourself for so many years to come. Like I'm, I remember thinking that I wasn't good at math for so long. And it wasn't that. It's just that I learned math differently. Like I'm an auditory learner. And there was no one who ever exposed me to that concept of, oh, Jacqueline, you learn a little bit differently. And so number one, I think that's the first lesson is recognizing that there are 7.7 .7 billion people out here in the world. And just because you don't lead like me, or lead like Jimmy or lead like Julie or Oprah or Mandela or whomever else, it doesn't mean that you're not a leader. I also would like to say as a second tip that I would like for your listeners, I would like for the world to see leadership in levels because we will often think, oh, I don't have an important role, position, status, or title, so I must not be a leader. Well, at the foundational level of leadership, you have got to lead yourself, right? And I think that's where the world gets in trouble. And many of you and I, all of us have probably seen it, where people are thrown into the gauntlet of leading other people and leading organizations and you've skipped over the level of being responsible for leading yourself right and so number one is buying into this important concept that we are leaders right you can be a self-leader you can give yourself permission to be a self-leader and to just commit to putting more things in your toolkit to refine as you go along so that's number two number three is i say this a lot in the book the importance of discovering defining and refining the leader in you and the reason i say that is because stuff happens like i want to say another s word but stuff happens along the way you can where, say shit happens okay, okay you got it you got it you did it for me <laughs> I will take my etiquette down a level no, for you. It's no weird. problem. <laughs> I got you. And when that stuff happens, we start to poke holes in who we are. All of a sudden, you just start thinking differently about yourself. And that's why I look at our whole leadership growth journey as cyclical. You're discovering, defining, refining the leader within you. Because that process for self versus that process for leading others, it's all like it's connected, but it has to go through its own cycle. And so I will say as number three, to give yourself permission to consistently discover, define, and refine the leader in you, even in the midst of making mistakes, even in the midst of having 
having sweaty, uncomfortable armpits because anxiety is kicking your butt. Even in the midst of like sometimes not knowing what you're doing, because I say all the time, like in most of the things that I start, I'm about 65% confident when I start. And then I'm like, mm, okay, I'm like going to figure the rest out. That's pretty high. Like, 65%? I wanted to- And why do you got to keep calling out my sweaty armpits right now? You can make people a little uncomfortable. <laughs> I mean, they, they're probably uncomfortable too, right? I, yeah. I will say this, just as a- as Just a, because of how sharp you are. And in the, uh, I'll come back to your uh, verbal etiquette uh, no, later on. No, this- but let me say this as a, as a little caveat here, because this is an important thing to say that I don't want to miss, Julie. And I'm sure Julie's like, Jacqueline and Jimmy, like, get it together. But we were actually just talking about armpits before you got on the call. To be <laughs> so you actually, like, weirdly read our mind. I'm just trying not to say that, but I did. I do want to, like, in the midst of talking about people who are just like, how do I discover this? How do I define this? I just want to talk about discomfort in the process, right? And I, I bring this up because I am uncomfortable a lot, right? I know I don't project that, you know, because I've been on stages and in front of screens for so long, like my fourth grade teacher taught me how to work a stage really early in my life. I know that I don't look nervous and I it doesn't look like I have any ounce of anxiety, but I manage anxiety pretty much daily. And I often have discomfort within me. And the reason why is for two reasons. Number one is I was diagnosed with anxiety when I was 19. So there's that piece, which I'll talk about in just a second. But then secondly, I recognize that and I buy into the fact that discomfort isn't bad. Like when I start something new, I haven't did it before. Like, so of course, like the amygdala in my head is going to say, oh girl, like you're afraid. Like you don't know what you're doing. And that's fine. Like it is okay. So I, I don't have a problem saying, oh, like I'm writing a second book. I'm, it's my first book deal. My first book was self-published. Second book was a book deal with Wiley Publishing. So excited, right? But I've never did this before. So guess what? I'm going to do it right? I'm going to be nervous. So I'm going to wear, go sleeveless when I can. I'm going to wear these Cubrexa wipes, which are great. If, if, if you haven't heard of these Cubrexa wipes, they help to eliminate sweat. And I'm going to wear a really strong deodorant and I'm going to keep going, right? And so I always consistently talk about discomfort, especially from someone who looks like they have it together and anxiety and how I'm constantly managing anxiety. I have coffee in my cup. Guess what? It's decaf because caffeine exacerbates my anxiety. I just have these things built in to keep me going and to keep me in the game. But I, I want to encourage other people to start the things they want to do, step into the leadership role or step into your own personal journey of leadership, even in the midst of being fearful, being uncomfortable, and when anxiety is completely kicking your butt. So after you just start, which is so true, right? You just start. Right. And you just you just, start. It's funny. I was just telling Jimmy when I go, when I travel, I, I, so I also leave and I also get very nervous and anxious is that I travel with a hoodie and at night I get into my hotel room. <laughs> And a scarf, and I hide under my covers and go, How did I just do that today? That was really scary. It's scary, right? I also say this. I believe after starting several things, after being very intimate with discomfort, that so many of our questions get answered in the action. But you got to give yourself permission to get started, right? Like you start moving, you do something. Oh my gosh, like here's a resource. Move and get going. Oh my gosh, like I met Jimmy and Jimmy plays basketball and I just wanted to be a point guard my whole life. And now he's going to teach me. Like so many of our questions get answered in the action. I'm, I'm more of a jump shooter than a dribbling coach. <laughs> Yeah. So some people would call me the shot doctor. Wow. Wow, Jimmy, you're really milking this now. I'm, I'm going to take it. It, may, it helps with my anxiety by <laughs> getting making jokes about potential you know, compliments to myself. But wouldn't you say in some way, though, that you're talking about you need to have self-agency to be able to lead first? A yeah. lot of that is also how you're going to start in a mentoring relationship. If you're not actually showing up for yourself, how are you going to show up for somebody else in those kind of relationships? Absolutely. And talking about feeling stressed or discomfort about something, you know, isn't that almost a way of being well adjusted is like being in touch with yourself enough, because if you don't feel any stress, I mean, there's probably something else occurring. And uh, it's possible like, you know, very much so I'm glad that you bring that up. Because I think that at some point in our life, maybe many of us were taught or, or not taught that feelings are normal, and that emotions happen, things happen, and, and more importantly, how we should triage those things. And I've been dealing with an emotion emotion that I've been managing since last year that I'm still trying to figure out. Like I've been dealing with grief. My father suddenly passed away last year. And as someone who has compartmentalized emotion for a long time, like I can, I can stash away emotion and like deal, it, deal with it when I want to deal with it. I have not been able to do that for grief. And it's been like, oh my gosh, like what do I do? It was because I was never taught. I and mean, most of us aren't taught like how to grieve because it's complicated. But you're right. For me, I'll speak for myself and, 
Jimmy and, and, and Julie, probably for you as well, that I know the reasons why I am anxious. I know that I care about people's time a lot. And I know that if I show up to a training, whatever the training is, someone could potentially sit in a session with me for 60 to 90 minutes and get up and walk away and say, that was a complete waste of my time. And they'll never get that back. And for me, that is really heavy. I can't do anything about that. I can't pay for more time. I can't beg, borrow, and steal. Once it's gone, it's gone. Like when the time is gone, it is literally gone. And so that's the reason why I practice, show up, like I go above and beyond. But there's also some anxiety that comes along with that. Like, whew, like I practice and I, I think I'm good at what I do. But still, there is a possibility that I could be wasting this person's time. And so I acknowledge that that's why the anxiety is there. Like, it's not that I don't know what I'm doing or I don't care about this. And you know what? I'm okay with that. If that's what keeps me motivated to keep practicing and doing the right thing and showing up for these people because I want to care about their time, then so be it. I want to come back to caring. I said something really big there. Yeah. But I know a lot of people can be anxious when they aren't organized and can't keep all their contacts together. Yeah. So our business mother hen is HubSpot and we are on the podcast HubSpot Network. Mm -hmm. And we are all here to grow together. So we're going to continue this plant metaphor mm -hmm. and listen, learn and grow because no matter your role or goal, there's always something for you on the HubSpot Podcast Network. Mm -hmm. So, But you said something really interesting to me, which was because you care about others, that makes you anxious. And mm -hmm. I know that's something that Julie and I really share. And it's clearly why you know, we're getting along too. Mm -hmm. is And that like desire to not waste somebody's time, not to, almost I mean, you feel bad for that person, but you'd feel so crappy yourself if yeah. you like took the gift of time from somebody else and you want that person to enjoy their time and therefore we're together. Can you talk a little bit about that and how mm -hmm. that like when you can channel that stress into you stress about caring about others and doing a good job by others? Yes. I think, sorry, just, and especially in terms of mentoring, right? I think like mentees and men mentees feel like I'm wasting their time. So yeah, yeah great a question. Absolutely. I am not sure when on my journey I became so aware of my desire to be impactful and super respectful of people's time. Like I'm not sure where, when that happened. It probably, honestly, it probably started to happen when I was a wedding and event producer because stuff needed to be on time. And there are some skills that I picked up during- I'm that sure that it seems like one of the most, besides being a Detroit Lion or working for the government, that seems like the third most terrifying job I can think oh of. God. You guys are going to mess up my happy home. I live in a Detroit Lions household. My husband is like a super fan. When we moved here to DC, he was flying back for season tickets for years. Okay. Oh my yeah, God. I mean, we're just a little scared of them. We think they're great. Yeah. No, just talk, talk about self flagellation. Why yeah, are you so doing this to Jimmy? You're trying to ruin my happy home. All right. So, <laughs> what I was trying to say is that in the wedding world, you know, time is in, so important. And I just develop, luckily, this huge respect for things being on time. And not only care about just people's time, but I also care deeply about people's opportunity in seeing themselves in a way that helps them give themselves permission to do things because the reason why the whole just start platform even came to be right it's a connection to time and mentoring and all the things is because i would travel to organizations across the country and teach leadership modern etiquette and then i would notice that at the end of class people would come up to get their book signed or just to you know have a conversation or take a photo with me and then they would go down this path of telling me the things that they wanted to do and then they would ask me for permission and it's like wait a minute like i just literally met you <laughs> A few minutes ago, right? What's your name again? Like, I'm sure I inspired you. I'm sure I hit that punchline real hard. You lose bumps. Like, all, all the things I know how to do well to inspire I, you. I love the casual. Like, I'm sure your life was rock. Things are great, <laughs> but... Mm -hmm. I'm sure you're ready to get out here and make it make it happen. Great. That was the goal. But you can't tell me that just in this 45 minutes, you're wanting me, this rando lady, to give you permission to do the things that you want to do. Like, you don't need permission, but... Truly, often what I found is that people were just missing a few things. Oh, I just need some accountability. Oh, I'm just missing a little bit of public speaking skills. Like these little things they were missing to at least get them started on the path. And man, once people like fully believe like what's possible, I believe I'm a leader. I believe that I don't need permission to start things or even to start to be a better leader. It is just a magical thing to watch and see for people to just go. 
right? To be great. And so I care about that. Like I care that our whole world can be changed. So many things can get solved for if so many smart people across the world just gave themselves permission to step into doing the thing that lights them up, that moves them, that gets them going. And I do believe at the same time that these conversations that I was having are almost like mini mentoring sessions, right? Like, oh, I'm giving you a little bit of what you need in a selfless way. Hopefully you're going, taking some action. You're holding yourself accountable, which I think are all huge parts of the whole mentoring process. And I think that, and hopefully you agree with what I'm about to say, because this would be weird and need to be edited out, is that it's sometimes a proof point of how sometimes mentoring can be a casual relationship, right? Like I know that there was a time when it was very formal, like sign here, put blood, you know, <laughs> secure, you know we're, to the end. we're together forever. <laughs> and I think, I believe that mentoring has changed a bit over time. Why? Because so many people, mentor, mentee, we both have access to information, much more information we used to. We both bring value. Hopefully we're both making deposits and withdrawals when we need to, to keep our relationship balance above the negative zone. And so I do think that even in those instances where maybe it was a touch point with someone, lives got changed, I got inspired, value was exchanged. Like it still was a mentoring exchange, which I think can just be life-changing for the person and also for for me. If I take your definition of etiquette being an accepted code of behavior for certain situations, yeah, that if somebody suddenly feels like they have an accepted code for a situation, mm. it incredibly increases their amount of self-agency to be able to then impact the world in ways they want to change it. And they feel empowered as opposed to suddenly feeling kind of caught and lost in whatever this web is. Yeah, what I'll say is yes. And I do believe that in order for etiquette to serve us, we do have to have some commonalities. So like there's an accepted code of behavior in my house. When you come in my house, me and my husband love to entertain. So most times you don't have to take off your shoes. Like we have hardwood floors because we don't want people to take off their shoes, right? It's easier to clean. My friends, the rules are you take your shoes off at my house, right? So except that I think that there has to be some common ground in, in amongst communities, right? And so perhaps the ex, you have accepted codes of behavior that you have for governing yourself, right? But I think once you move and other people are included, you do have to be inclusive and there has to be some common ground. But overall, the statement that you made about self-agency, I think when you feel like, hey, I am responsible for governing myself, or when you buy into that, I'm responsible for governing myself, I'm responsible for my own leadership development journey, which I wholeheartedly believe that, I think you give yourself permission to start to acquire what you need. I think you just start to realize, like, I am worthy of pouring into people. I am worthy of other people pouring into me. I think that it's all a part of the process of giving yourself permission. Right. And I think mentoring fits in there because you need people and people need you. Well, this is what I think I got so much from your book. Again, Unexpected Leader it was exactly that. Right. When you are really stepping into that leadership role, you might not have seen yourself that way from the very beginning. When you yeah. said, what do I want to do when I grow up? Um, and I love how one of your chapters is building your tribe. And oh. so I really related to that because that was very much you are on your journey. You've taken a look at your leadership styles, you've evaluated yourself, you have some awesome tools to be able to walk through. And it's like, okay, build your tribe. For our listeners who maybe are on this leadership journey, do you have some really, you know, kind of tactical tips for how they can go about finding their tribe? Absolutely. I believe that a good starting point for building your tribe is number one, accepting that you don't know everything, accepting that feedback is necessary, and accepting that a great place to start is with four types of of mentors. You can call them mentors. You can call them your boards of directors. If you want to get super fancy about it, you can call it your clique, your tribe, your crew, whatever you feel good about. I want you to have these four different types. I want you to have a coach, someone that is willing to ask tough questions sometimes. I think that you need an educator, someone that is willing to fill your knowledge gaps. You need a cheerleader, somebody that's like rah-rah. Like literally, this is the one person that always likes your social media posts. Like you can always count on blah, blah to like your social media posts, right? It's always one of them. I know who mine is. I won't say their name, but I love you, okay? And then you need a challenger, this is the person that is not, does have no problem with borderline hurting your feelings in the name of getting you great. And They're totally you okay to like blow you up on national listen, television. Listen, but I mean, I don't know about national television, but well, they, they're- That was really, a bad NASA joke. I didn't know if they were also a customer of yours, given your federal oh, government work. No, no, stop it, Jimmy. No, <laughs> no, okay. What they are is someone that's willing to say, you're wrong. Like, I love you, but you're wrong. Let's get you right. Like, let's get the answers. This person's not willing to hurt your feelings. 
in the name or for the sake of you becoming better, becoming greater. And I think most people, lots of people have cheerleaders. Where most people lack at in terms of building your tribe is that challenger because we want to hear what we want to hear, right? I want to hear I'm great. Jacqueline, you're awesome. When I think about feedback to other people, it is so easy for me to say, Julie, great job. Jimmy, fantastic, right? It's a bit harder for me to say, Julie, thank you for the report. Thank you. You got a den in time. Next time, what I want you to do is, it takes extra energy. It takes work. Julie's going to ask me some questions back. But guess what? Like, I'm your challenger. Like, I'm supposed to make your stuff better. But I'll say those four are what I recommend. And the, the other thing I'll say is, I think that there was a time when we thought, or I'll say I thought even, that mentorship was like a lifelong relationship. Like, oh, I link up with blah, blah. And they're my mentor for 36 years, right? Or we may have thought, oh, my mentors can only be people that are older than me and have 30 years, you know, in the game over me. Not really. Like there are people who are 20 years younger than me that teach me things that are amazing. I'm like, wow, you're like a young millennial and I'm a really old millennial. I'm like the oldest millennial there is. So they have a totally different perspective on everything, right? And so I do think being willing to welcome people in your circle that are different than you, welcoming people that fit those four categories and swallowing your ego long enough (laughs) to get the feedback that you need to get to where you want to go. Like that is the baseline of what I would recommend for people who are trying to build your bench, build your circle, get more mentors and really, really build the leader that you have within you. I need to come to a word that we haven't really talked about since the beginning, but- It was, it's a, it's a topic I can't stop thinking about, which is outlook. Mm. And you mentioned in the very beginning, and, and I think mentors or the, the four people of uh, the, of your circle that you need, those four types are all kind of helping you see different angles in this outlook. But you, you mentioned earlier on that you, you grew up in a house where you weren't like dreaming about what your next job is. Mm-hmm. And you also mentioned that you started a business and you weren't necessarily looking for that next client. But obviously at some point, suddenly you saw a much different world world around you Mm -hmm. and where you could go. Was there a certain individual person moment, you know, situation where it kind of clicked in your head in a way like, oh, wow, this isn't just going to be Jacqueline's business. This is Scarlet. Like Mm -hmm. we're, we're taking it on and I can do almost whatever I want within this. Can't do it all at once, but I can do anything. Oh, I want to answer this question a lot of different ways. So I'm going to try to. While there is not one person that's just like, oh, that person totally lifted the veil. What actually happened and what I think happens for a lot of I was really of- hoping you were going to say you met Barry Sanders and he just like changed your life, you know, and then your husband was like, you know, Barry, oh my God. Like, No, Jimmy, okay. it's not what happened. Okay. I've never met him. I'm, I'm back on mute. My bad. Yeah. What has happened over time is that people get dropped into my life and you can, you can transcode or translate drop into my life however you see fit. Some people may say divine intervention. People, some people may say the nature gods, they blessed you. You're like, however you see it. Some people or have like, shown, hit them with a car or something. Right. Something, right. The people have made themselves visible in my life and have planted nuggets that I think in looking back have helped helped me to the next level. And when I say that, it could have been sometimes the most passive things. But what I did begin to do is I began to pay attention to people's support and to not take the things that we had accomplished at an or- at the organization as luck or just something that just randomly happened. And so I think that I have learned over time to not discount a compliment and to often think about like, huh, what does this compliment mean? What skill set do I have that has warranted this compliment, right? So to make it plain for everyone, think about the last time someone said to you, nice shoes, nice job on that speech. Many of us will say, it's nothing. Like, oh, I got these shoes from Target. Oh, that report only took me five minutes. Like we start to belittle people's compliments to the point that sometimes they'll they'll stop saying them because it's like, oh, she just got these shoes from Walmart. Like, okay, must not be that important to her. Oh, that report only took you five minutes. Like here's a whole bunch more five minute tasks. Instead, I started to recognize that people say, great job on that speech, that presentation. It really, right? Or this really touched me in blah, blah, blah way. And then I start to think like, oh, there's some skills underneath here. Like this is not just magic. And so that's one thing I did is I started to recognize that thank you. Remember that. No, thank 
thank you is a complete sentence too. So that's number one. Number two is to recognize the people who are investing in my life and not investing, not necessarily financially, but just even skill set, networks, compliments, right? Just show of affection, just to recognize the people that are there and what they're doing and why they're doing it, to be appreciative for that, like very appreciative. We started the Scarlet, as I said before, um, teaching etiquette to teen girls, but truly the first organization that we ever taught for was the Rhonda Walker Foundation. Rhonda Walker Foundation is a inner city program in Detroit that is a five-year program for girls to help them like matriculate through their last year of middle school and then high school. And they spend a lot of time with the girls. And Rhonda Walker is a Channel 4 news anchor. She's a big anchor and well-known in the city of Detroit. And I realized in looking back, like she was that mentor for a certain period of time, even though we never had a mentor-mentee relation, it was never formalized. She opened the door for me to teach. She let me test the program on her girls that had, she already had this program for 10 years. I taught for the Detroit Lions. She asked if I could do a Channel 4, a, a big news story on me. Lots of organizations saw that story, which is why a lot of companies companies end up calling right? And so I think for a certain period of time, we had this informal relationship. Then, you know, I can think about tons of other women like Miss Renee Fluker from Midnight Golf. I could think about my ex-boss, Andy Miller from AARP Innovation Labs. Andy and I are different in every possible way. Like Andy is a white man. In regular life, we will probably never hang out together. Like we have nothing in common. But like over time, we've become friends and he truly served in a mentoring capacity for me. To answer your question, Jimmy, I know that that was a, a long way to say that. I think that many of the spaces that I've been in have been a result of people showing themselves as resources, um, people being able to invest time, intellect, you know, sometimes financial resources. But me recognizing that, you know, number one, this doesn't need to be a lifelong situation. I'm going to be grateful. I'm going to give where I can give. Recognizing the compliments that have come, like, okay, this person says this over and over again. So this is probably a skill that I truly have and not just magic. And so I think that that's how that has manifested in my life in terms of the people who've shown up and has, have really made me see what's possible long term. I have that hugely circled on the page up here at the top. I don't know if you can see it on page 37. Luck and happenstance. The luck and happenstance. I made giant circles around it. Yeah. I'm very guilty of just saying it was lucky when things happen. So it, it, again, it, really related to so much of this. It was like, yes. Some of it is. I hey, y'all. Jimmy here. And I wanted to wish you a happy new year. Jimmy, it's February. No. Uh, okay. Dropping Feliz Año Nuevo is basically a forgotten memory. You're right, Julie. And we are busy. Our digital remote world means business leaders are challenged even more to align teams on mission and goals for the next year. However, instead of doing the real, like the real work, have you found yourself wrangling disconnected data, getting lost in docs and drive, instead of actually talking to your customers? My secret, get organized. And then get automated, just like a cool drink on a hot day, HubSpot CRM hits the spot by keeping your marketing, sales, ops, and service teams in sync on one powerful platform. More companies are choosing HubSpot every day because of the fantastic value of the platform. It's affordable, packed with features, and scales as fast as you can. Learn how HubSpot can help your business grow better at HubSpot.com. I mean, I'm a big fan of the podcast. I think I mentioned it in the book too. I'm a big fan of the podcast, How I Built This, NPR podcast with Guy Raz, right? Like I feel like a little bit of a Guy Raz groupie, but- I mean, who isn't? Any self well just person is a Guy Raz groupie. I mean, my goodness, right? And so, you know, I, I'm a fan of the question at the end of his show, which is, you know, what do you contribute or do you attribute your success to luck or to hard work, right? And most people, most people say, you know, it's a combination. Like I'm I'm going to work hard, but then sometimes it's just flat out right place, right time, or it's right place, right time. And then you got to work hard to keep that luck going, you know? So I do think for me, it's been a combination of both. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm pretending like Guy Ross just asked me that and he totally didn't. But that's when he I comes on the show, we will have you back on. Ooh. We all have the discussion together. We promise. Okay. Pinky swear. We'll make it packed. <laughs> okay. swear. Yeah, it, it, it's like, you know, uh, hard work creates luck. You know, if, if you don't go out and chase a hundred cars, you're never going to catch one. Ooh. I love hard work creates luck and I'm going to go now and purchase hard work, hard work creates luck.com. I already bought snacks on snacks on snacks.com. So don't even try. Yeah, watch out. I, I'm going to buy more. He's a compulsive go daddy shopper. <laughs> Jimmy, you are? All right. If you, if you get, if you start the nonprofit snacks on snacks.org, you know, I'll do the for profit and I'll, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll run it together. I don't know. I don't know. It sounds like you're going to make the cash and I'm going to have to be out begging for donors and donors. Well, then let's switch. I'll donate to, 
At, we'll figure it out. Offline. <laughs> offline. We'll figure it out. We got this. First, I hope that at the next time you have a James Bond themed dinner party, Ooh. you know, Julie and I can, can be showing up. So. I hope so too. I, what would be weird is if you just showed up because I know you're not far from me and it's like, oh, hey, nothing's weird here. Welcome. I just wanted to have a long discussion about whether it's Dan Campbell or Jared Goff who should go first. Neither. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I'm having too much fun. If I could, uh, Jacqueline, we, we do this piece where I do like a rapid fire word association. Yep. And you already actually took the word coach and gave fantastic, you know, coach about seeing magic is what I took from that. Mm -hmm. And we're really looking for like how you would define something and ideally even just one word. Okay. So when I say the word mentor, what would you say back? Support. And if I said the word mentee, how about now? Support. Ooh. <laughs> You didn't see that coming, Got did him. you? So if I say sponsor, what would you say? Door opener. Oh, I got the hyphen. It's one word. We're good. Okay, fantastic. And then you've had so many great quotes already, like leadership legacy, dabble in lies. Never put those together. That was, <laughs> I don't know if you say that regularly, but I that don't. Was awesome. I just made it up. That was great. Uh, you can get really that URL, also dabbleinlies.com. Excuse me. Pop this. Let me go to. <laughs> <laughs> Let's I don't know what this is, but. <laughs> Is there like a quote that you remember like immediately from Rhonda Walker or something mm -hmm. else that you almost use as like a mantra at times to get through to the next phase or something that like you keep in your head? I have a few. So I'm going to I'm going to just rattle out the ones that I know yeah. I think. Well, will apply. There's a reason this segment is called Let's Get Crazy because the more okay. the better. So just start. No surprise there. It's just everything. OK, in, in every possible way. Give yourself permission. This one, I want to explain a little bit. It's you're okay. You're okay. I, I say to myself a lot, like when I feel overwhelmed, when I feel like, okay, I'm a little confused. I just have to remind myself like, yep, you're overheating. Like it feels like your carburetor is broken in this moment, but you're okay. You're okay. I say that. One of my friends just texted me the other day, uh, a friend of mine named Jametta. She is an alum of Clemson. We do some work with Clemson. And I, I think she may have gotten my book. And so she just texted me randomly out of nowhere and said just the sweetest thing. And I haven't messaged her back yet because I had to sit in it for a minute. She said to me, keep going, which I say that a lot to people. You are inspiring women that you will never meet, but you will reach them. I was just like, yes, you know, I do want to meet them right? But more importantly, I want to reach them and I can impact you. That's life's work right there all day long. That's way more than what I was going to say after you're okay, you're okay. Because I used to say that all the time mm. when playing dodgeball with children, when you're a counselor, you get a lot of backspin on the ball. So it usually if you aim for the chest, it hits them in the face and you got to run up and just say, you're okay, you're okay, you're okay. Don't tell your parents. <laughs> Duck, dodge. You're dip. Did you see dodgeball, Jimmy? Oh, yeah. Yeah. If you can dodge a wrench, you can dodge a ball. Yeah. I mean, why would you ever say something like that? Dodgeball. Why would you? Anyway. <laughs> okay. But my last question, because you're an expert in etiquette and there's definitely different ways to approach situations, social situations. Is there a certain prompt? We call it our no fly list that you're like, never say this when reaching out to somebody that you want to have like a genuine earnest and potentially a sharing of vulnerability uh, relationship down the road? I don't like the phrase, let me pick your brain. I just don't like it. That is 10 out of 10, the phrase everybody says. I don't like the word, right? I don't like the phrase, but I recognize that some people, that's what they know. Like somebody told them at some point, like if you want to talk to somebody, you want to get mentorship or you want to you know, get some information from somebody, just ask to pick their brain, right? And nobody knows that that word gets underneath my skin. I try to suspend my judgment because somebody taught them that was good. I mean, somebody taught them that was okay. And then until I can be influential in their life and tell them why they should think about some other words, you know, I try to silence my ego, my thoughts, and hear what it is that they need and hopefully sneak in the don't say that anymore because it's terrible words. I love that. So I think in those moments that you're okay, you're okay when you're about to go jump at somebody. It's like, okay. You're okay. You're okay. They're okay. You're okay. Just okay. like, you know, okay. yeah. Have that gentleness. Well, I want to say. I well, we could. If I can just say one more thing though, Jimmy, because I think that what I want to do want to say next, just because I do want to give people, I do want to make sure that people are listening. They do have some guidance in like, oh my gosh, I want to reach out to somebody. Like, what should I be thinking of? And I know you cover the gamut of lots of things in the, in the mentorship space. But what I will say is in reaching out, while there isn't a phrase that I think I would say, don't say this, the things that I would encourage people to do and that I always think very highly of someone when they're like, oh my gosh, like they came at me correct is number one, 
respect the time. We don't get it back. And number two, take ownership. And so those are two things that I think are worth people thinking about when they're reaching out to folks. And be cognizant that you never know if you're talking to a neurosurgeon and they might want you to say, come, come pick my brain. I'd love to hear about it. <laughs> So you walked right into that one. You're like, this is going to go did. somewhere. I did yeah. it. I worked it was like really, it. That was very nice of you. I appreciate that. <laughs> I did it on purpose. <laughs> Got him. <laughs> you knew that was, was going to work for somebody. That was definitely going to work for somebody. That is exactly the person, a neurosurgeon. I just want to say, The Unexpected Leader, I, I am so grateful to have had the chance to read the book. I'll definitely share it with the burgeoning leaders in my life. And we're so grateful that we got to have you on the podcast today. Thank you so, so much. I don't know how many times we can say it. What a treat. Jacqueline Baker, please invite me to your dinner party. I don't think we should dress as a Detroit Lions. So I think we I think we overused that one. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry about that, Mr. <laughs> Baker. My, my apologies. But seriously, Jacqueline was phenomenal. And I really liked how she did something that nobody else brought up on any of our earlier podcasts when we did our word association segment. And she said both for mentor and for mentee, the same word. She said support. Mm -hmm. And I think that's a big deal. Nobody else connected it. And I think that really is a good tie to our augmenter's thesis where you just need to show up for the other person. That's what's so critical. That's what the mentoring relationship's about. It's not about power dynamic or prefix ship, whatever it is. It's two people showing up to support each other. And Jacqueline evinced that with her. I say mentor, you say support. I say mentee, you say support. Boom. It was great. It was such a such an aha. I love that. It's so true. And it, part of it is just asking for help, which I know we've talked about a lot of times as well. I did also love the connection to etiquette because to be honest, I had never thought of it. When she mentioned it, I thought of, and I was in middle school. I went to a private school and they had like etiquette class that only the fancy rich kids went to, which did not include me. So I eat with my hands and basically am a complete you know, <laughs> etiquetteless person, but it, it's so true. It was kind of thought of as this very hoity-toity fancy thing that the fancy kids got to do, but it's so important. And how are you able to show up appropriately to different venues? So I loved how she connected etiquette to leadership and leadership to mentoring. So it was a really interesting way to look at it. I'm so grateful we had the chance to hear that. Thank you, Jacqueline. The book, Unexpected Leader. Find it on Amazon, rated five stars. <laughs> We hope this episode was brief yet bright, and now it's time to read us out. And remember, we are here because real relationships have the power to transform organizations and build dynamic communities. Go ahead, Jimmy. Absolutely. Augmenters supports mentoring that matters. Visit our website for the best interactive mentoring content at augmenters.us. Share our podcast with someone you care about someone who needs a new mentoring relationship in their life pronto. We welcome questions and suggestions via email, hi at augmenters.us, or via social media with our handle at augmentershq. Shout out to our producers, Erlen Cato. Thank you. Augmenters out. See ya. See ya.